Hey everybody, before we get into our episode today, we just want to give a shout out to uh, a podcast that we've actually started being friends with on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They are the That's Not Good podcast. Yeah, Hannah and Amber. They have true stories of the world of the weird. They pretty much touch all topics of ghastly stories. Awesome. So here's their promo. Hey guys, this is Hannah. And I'm Amber. And we're That's Not Good, a true crime podcast. Where we talk about everything from true crime, to paranormal, to ghost stories, to weirdness. And we're kind of funny too. We sure are. Find us on our socials at That's Not Good, a true crime podcast. And wherever you listen to podcasts. Just do it. See you there. Bye. Bye. Okay, hey, awesome. If you're looking for a new true crime podcast to listen to, go give them a, a listen and see how you feel. Yeah. I think I'm going to start listening to them because I'm running out of podcasts, even <laughs> though we're part of an Instagram group that has like every podcast yeah. right now. And I'm, I'm trying to catch up and it's well, like, it's a struggle. You're a truck driver and that's all you do all day is just sit on your ass and listen to podcasts. Yeah, pretty much. I'm going through a lot of people's catalogs right mm-hmm. now. I know you come home and you're like, oh my God, you've got to start listening to this podcast because they're so good. I know. Now we're going to get on to our regular scheduled program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to World's True Crime. My name is Denise, and with me, as always, is my wonderful fiancé, Brad. I should be saying this one because we are reversing it today. We are, because I'm still really sick, and I'm struggling to even talk right now. The COVID has hit her hard. It has. But we have a... We're, she's well enough to able to at least co-host for me today. Well, I wrote the story, too. I know. So this is really weird, because uh, I can't... You know, be like, ooh, ah, I and know I am what totally happened. Totally scooping it from you. <laughs> I know, but I can't talk. I'm like struggling not to even cough right now. So yeah. So before we get onto it, we have a lot to talk about before we get into it. Well, you're going to do most of the okay. talking. First off, we are going to say that we are finishing off our sticker contest. Yes, because we have a Patreon page going. We started a Patreon, and so we're just going to end this here. And if you guys want this stuff, you just go out to Patreon and you can get it there. Yeah, but we do have a winner from our last episode. We did miss last week because, as we already said, COVID really. But we do have a winner from the the week before. It was Patty Kinney from from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. She was, again, grateful for it and everything. And she just wishes us all the best and loves our podcast. So. Thank you, Patty Kenny. Yeah, thank you very much. And you are the last winner of our contest. Yeah, was she the first one too? I think she was pretty close to the the top one too. So yeah, I'm going to mail that off to her. Um, COVID free. You won't get any COVID on the the envelope. Yeah, we'll sanitize it first. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, also too, as we touched on just before this, we started a Patreon. Mm -hmm. So you could find that in our show notes if you are interested. If not, it's all good. Yep. And also, too, another big piece of news that we have is we started a merch store. We did, and I'm going to go broke because <laughs> I'm <laughs> going to be shopping on there. I even like uh, thought, you know what? I can like buy stuff and give them away for Christmas, you know, presents oh, yeah. to all the family. And like, yeah, now you're going to be promoting, you know, our stuff. <laughs> but yeah. yet, I got the gifts. <laughs> yeah, we have. Uh, are three designs mm-hmm, and you so put it on pretty much like anything like shirts and whatever yeah yeah three of sam's uh designs and she's gonna keep working on it but again she's hit uh busy season so with her work so eventually we'll get more on there yeah but we've got it started so yeah we got patreon merch we did a lot during this covid time off <laughs> y- you did i did a lot of sleeping and uh moaning yeah <laughs> wanting to just die well, nothing else to do because like everybody's separate in our house right now because our son actually got COVID as well. So we kind of had everybody separated and I was just kind of like going to work and coming home and doing this stuff. Yeah. Parents still have COVID. Oh my gosh. 
Yeah. I thought COVID was going away. No, it looks like it's like wrapping up. And I was careful because I'm still the one that wears the mask when I go to physio and stuff like that. And still, but I guess I got it when my mom was in the hospital. And where else where did you get COVID? But go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so I think that's it for all of us. Everything we'll have will be in our show notes. And yeah, let's keep moving forward. Yeah. So you're going to read this. I'll start off with the, the intro, but you can read this story because... Oh my God, my throat hurts so bad. Yeah, so this isn't my story, so bear with me if I end up getting things wrong. Yeah, you will. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are going to be in the United States this week. Yes, we are. But we're going to go back a little bit into the past. A, l- a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this case today, we'll be talking about George Jefferson Hassel, who was an American mass murderer, spree killer, and serial killer who killed his wife and eight children ranging in ages between 1 and 21 years old on December 5th, 1926 in Farwell, Texas. But why stop there? George also killed his wife and three stepchildren in 1917 in California. Sounds like a winner right here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're ready to get into it? I'm ready for you to. Okay. George Hassel was born in Smithville, Texas on July 5th, 19- 1888. Mm-hmm. No, it's an old one. <laughs> Denise has wrote that he was the youngest of eight children. I did read that. There was seven or eight. So it doesn't freaking matter anyways. Yeah. There are big no, family. Yeah. There are no real records of his parents' deaths, but George had said that his mother died in 1901 by his father's hands. Mm-hmm. His father had beaten his mother to death when George was only 13 years old. His father remarried after his wife's passing, but George claimed that his stepmother had poisoned his father. Failed. Failed. Okay. There's a lot of poisoning back then. <laughs> I put a little arsenic in your food. Yeah. <laughs> I built up an immunity to it. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. George's father said he'd planned to kill her and anyone with her, but said, I got too much whiskey and didn't use any gun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, lovely jo- family. Yeah. George also had a lengthy history of criminal behavior. Mm-hmm. Since the age of 17, George had been fantasizing about murdering. Doesn't every 17-year-old? <laughs> no. <laughs> After his- Just me? <laughs> yeah, I <I'm> guess. Ki- <laughs> no, I'm kidding. After his father murdered his mother, George ran away and became a drifter. And after his father's death in 1905... He went to Abilene and fell in with a bad crowd. He embezzled some money for which he was convicted and sentenced to two years in prison. George also never held down a job because he was either stealing from his employer or stealing from his customers. Yeah, he's a great kid. Club little cup domaniac right yeah, there. Yeah, five finger discount. Yeah. When George was 18 years old, he fell in love with a young woman in Buffalo Gap, Taylor County, Texas. Buffalo Gap, Taylor County, Texas. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm not American. <laughs> okay. He married her in December 1909 and moved to Abilene, Texas. I bet you we would get more information about this from Evil Pudding because they're uh, in Texas. Yes. Cor- Courtney? Yeah. Oh, Courtney Patrick? Patrick? Yeah, they're in Texas. So we should have got them with some information <laughs> so, from there them. There was a bone. <laughs> Next, he moved to Fort Worth where he was a night watchman and then a farm to Hobart, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. <laughs> He sent his wife and their baby son to Winters, Texas, while he went on to Oklahoma for work. George said, We promised to write every day when we parted. I wrote, but a week passed before I heard from my wife. Then I received a letter that stated she was through with me. That ruined my life. I joined the Army and deserted to join the Navy in California, but I longed to see my wife and baby while I was in the Navy. So beat it back to Abilene. Still, she refused to have anything to do with me, so I went back to California and rejoined the army. Army authorities re- arrested me for desertion, and after I had served two years in my army prison, the old longing to see the wife and child came over to me, and I planned to return to Taylor County, but my wife wouldn't answer my letters. Maybe she, uh, you know, knew what kind of evil he was. Maybe. After a string of short-lived marriages, he found himself in Whitier, California. In the Whittier or Whittier? Whittier. Whittier sounds better. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, probably Whittier. Whittier? California. <laughs> I love California. Never been. 
Well, I only went to Disneyland. Must be nice. It was. <laughs> his first love would always be his only love. Yeah, While- he was truly in love with her. Oh, really? Yeah, like, this is, I think, what catapulted him into, like, going to evil because he loved her so much. Oh, while in White Ear, he met a woman named Mary Vogel. Vogel? Vogel. I try to be a little bit more fancy with it. Vogel. Vogel. <laughs> Who had three adopted children of her own. The relationship didn't last long, though, and we'll go into that later into the story. Yeah, I thought about adding it here, but then I was like, you know what? Let's just wait on that one. Okay. It just doesn't make sense to put it in right now. Okay. Let's build up to what kind of evil this guy is. Sounds good. Okay, so George decided to go to Farwell, which is on the Texas-New Mexico border, where his brother Thomas and his wife Susan were living with his nieces and nephews. George met his fifth and final wife, Oklahoma-born Susie Ferguson, by his brother Thomas. Fifth. (laughs) Fifth. Fifth. (laughs) He gets around a lot. (laughs) Yeah, we've been engaged for like, what, 14 years, 13 for years? We've been together for 15 years, so, yeah. I don't know. So, George's brother, Thomas, was married to Susie, Mm -hmm. but unfortunately, Thomas died when an alleged mule kicked him in the head while working in the fields with his brother, George. Mm -hmm. George decided to stay and help his brother's widow bring in the crops. Seeing as she had eight children on the rented homeland in Farwell, just 60 miles south of Amarillo... Yeah, isn't that like that was a controversy right there? Is what actually happened because this guy turns out to be a murderer, right? So, did he murder his brother and blame it on a mule? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to like because he ends up with his wife, right? His brother's wife. It's hard to like stage a mule kick because they hit pretty hard, I think. They can, but he could have just like bludgeoned him, right? And said, Oh, mule kicked him, right? So Doing all this was common for the time period. A family member dies and other family members jump in and help out. Mm -hmm. Those two were like vinegar and water, though. They had nothing in common. George was a short-tempered man that was baldy and a heavy drinker who had an eye for the ladies. Susie, on the other hand, was a devout Christian who spent her pastime reading her Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bible thumper. (laughs) Yeah. Even so, the two got close and were married. Six months later, in 1924, they welcomed a boy they called Samuel into the world. So they had something in common. Um, Uh, Yeah, a child, yeah. No, sex. Well, everybody does. (laughs) Keep it warm. (laughs) Okay, so I guess Denise is going to do some movie time for me, apparently. Oh, yeah, I guess it's that time. So obviously this is December 5th, 1926. We're probably going to move a little bit forward, aren't we? Maybe not. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, we're going to go to uh, December 5th, 1996. I was going to pick other ones, but they're so easy. So 70 years ahead. Yeah. Okay. Ready. Okay, so this is an animated movie. Okay. It's a remake. Okay. It has Jeff Daniels in it. Jeff Daniels, okay. Keep going. Hugh Laurie. Oh, House? I don't know. Yeah, he's from House. Yeah. Um, Mark Williams. Jolie Richardson. I'm not going to say the main person. <laughs> it almost sounds like the, the nut job or Ice Age or something. No. Um, this is, okay, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the top person. Okay. Okay. Glenn Close. Oh, Hunter One Dalmatians? It is. <laughs> okay. And I knew I couldn't give you that one because I knew you're going to get it. Well, the only person I know with that movie is, a uh, is Glenn Close. I don't know who the other actors were. So. Oh, really? Yeah. That's why I never, I have no idea. Oh, okay. Well, maybe other people got it. Maybe. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That was a good one. You're welcome. <laughs> now you can continue on with the story and give me a break. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on the night of December 5th, 1926, 
George and his 41-year-old wife, Susie, had an argument. George started to pack up to leave because their fight became more common and she always took the children's side over him, which infuriated him. I would always take my kids over you. You really, uh, you know what? I don't blame you. (laughs) I'd take their side too over me. (laughs) (laughs) He had been gathering their crops and had plans to go to the oil fields when it was all done to get rough money to start another crop. Yeah, he wanted to get some money so, yeah, they could start another crop on their, their rented farmland. Yeah. Susie thought he was leaving her. Then she questioned him about her 13-year-old daughter, who was also his niece. Maudie became pregnant, and him being the father? Yeah, she suspected that he was having a, a relationship with, with her, her daughter. With her 13-year-old daughter? Yeah. Oh. 13 year old daughter his niece slash niece, yeah. And stepdaughter. Yeah. Okay. Seeing red, George went to the barn where he had whiskey stashed away. Drinking about a pint of it, he went back to the main house, which was a five bedroom wooden framed home, and Susie started at him again. Oh, I'd start at him again too. I'd be like, this conversation is not in the least done yet. Next to the bed was a ball peen hammer. Ball peen hammer, eh? Mm hmm. Shouldn't every, you know, bedside accessory be a ball peen ma- hammer? <laughs> okay. This was probably put there by Susie from protection from intruders. George got so enraged, he took the ball peen hammer and hit Susie with it in the face twice, and then he stopped. Mm-hmm. Susie was still alive, so George started to strangle her first with his hands, and then he grabbed a stocking and wrapped it around her neck and hit her in the head with an axe. There was blood everywhere. Well, an axe wound is going to leave some blood. Yes. This is when George woke up 22-month-old Sammy. He started to cry from the commotion. George went to him, wrapped his large hands around his neck, strangling him to stuffle his cries. I guess we should have put a little trigger warning out here first because this is a young child. Trigger warning. Well, if people are listening to our podcast, they should already know that there's a lot of trigger. True crimes. Yeah. yeah. And this is a family with kids, right? It's from mm-hmm. 1 to 21. I guess we said that earlier. Exactly. For a brief moment, he thought, what have I done? But that didn't last long before he thought, I had best go on and kill the whole outfit. Mm-hmm. Next was four-year-old Nanny Martha, then six-year-old Johnny, and then seven-year-old David. There was only three more children alive in the house. George then used the hammer to kill his pregnant stepdaughter, Maudie. George blamed her since her condition set off this whole bloody spree. Her condition didn't set off nothing. He had deep thoughts already. Was he actually the father? Do you know? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, but she was 13, right? So, mm-hmm. okay. It's 13 hard. pregnant and being murdered by your stepdad, uncle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. George walked into the 11-year-old Russell's room, but Russell woke up and then 15-year-old Virgil woke up too. The two boys started to fight back, scratching and hitting George in the face, and were even able to hit George in the head with a brick. Unfortunately, George managed to get his gun and shot Virgil in the chest. Russell tried to make a run for it, but he was not fast enough. George caught him and choked him until he passed out. While he was out, George hit him in the head with an axe. Again. Mm-hmm. Oh, he's got like, he's got all these weapons, right? He's got stockings, hands, <laughs> axe, gun. Yeah. Like he's just using all of it. And so much rage. Right. George murdered everybody in this house. His family was now deceased. There's only one member left, but he wasn't there. George knew it would be long before his eldest stepson, 21-year-old Alton, would show up from his job in Clovis, New Mexico, where he was threshing wheat for extra money. What is threshing wheat, do you know? I think that's like when you... The scythe? Yeah. Okay. George could have run at this point, but he chose to stay and wait for the oldest to come home, who was supposed to be back in four days. In the meantime, George cleaned up the blood and buried all the bodies, in a newly dug root cellar by the house before he was caught. Five days later, and that's a day late, Alton came home. It wasn't busy like he expected with all the kids running around. The house was eerily quiet. When he questioned his stepdad, George, where everybody was, he said, 
The all went to visit their aunt in Shallow Water, Texas. I don't know where Shallow Water is. According to Patrick, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> they, they would know. Buying the lie given, since he had no reason not to believe his stepdad, the two killed a chicken to have for dinner that night. George started to drink whiskey, trying to get the courage to kill it again. He knew he had to finish the job. At 4 a.m., when Alton was asleep, George snuck into his room with a shotgun barrel against his skull and pulled the trigger, spattering blood all over the wall. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast, but you just weren't sure how to even start? That was us too. We love listening to podcasts and always thought, hey, what if we started one too? That's when we found Buzzsprout and haven't looked back since. With Buzzsprout, they made it so easy. To start, you don't need all the expensive gear. If you have a recording device and a quiet space, then you're on your way to creating a great podcast. But if you do want to get the best that's available, then let us assure you, Buzzsprout can help with that. They provide so many tools and resources to help guide you along the way. So now that you've signed up with Buzzsprout and use the link that we've provided in our show notes, after two months of your subscription, you will receive a $20 Amazon gift card. You have now joined hundreds of thousands of others and became a podcaster and you will be heard all over the world on all major platforms like Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Amazon, and many more. So what are you waiting for? Today is the day to come join us on the adventure of a lifetime and watch your number of downloads grow with the up-to-date location tool to see exactly where your audience is. This is where the magic begins. Come join us on Buzzsprout, where starting a podcast is made easy. For three weeks, George hoped that the murders would remain undiscovered until he had time to formulate his escape. But what gave George's secrets away was when he started to sell the family possessions in a large yard sale. Now, you probably don't want to do that. No. Selling stuff like no. after you just killed them. Oh. He told people that his family was moving back to Blair, Oklahoma, and they needed to make some money. The rental property where George was staying became very busy. People were looking for the next deal. Residents in the community found this suspicious, as Susie wouldn't just leave without saying her goodbyes or even mentioning anything about such a huge event in her life, like leaving her friends. That's just not the way she was. Inside the house, bidders found trunks and suitcases full of women's and children's clothes. More strange was what they also found Susie's religious books and pamphlets which she would never have gotten rid of or even left behind. Mm -hmm. That was the giveaway right there. Well, she's very religious, right? Mm -hmm. During the auction, a wagon ran over the sinkhole and aroused the suspicion of law enforcement. Yeah, because the ground was all soft. Right. The reasoning that brought attention was because it was like the ground had recently been dug up for a root cellar making the ground soft. Why would someone make a crudely built root cellar when they were moving? Exactly. That was like suspicions right nonetheless the auction had made him a whopping thirty five hundred dollars which is about sixty two thousand dollars canadian today yeah that's, that's a lot a, of money that's a lot of moolah yeah that that's mm. when i uh, googled it i was just like what so i had to redo it like oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> george didn't leave the property right away even though the landlord had rented out to another tenant George still had one room he wanted to clean out, so the new tenant allowed him to stay for a few days to finish that off. Stacking suitcases against one wall, George scrubbed the floor. One night after eating dinner with the new tenants, George told them he wasn't feeling well, so he was going to go to retire for the night. A few minutes after going to bed, he told the tenants to go get a doctor and the sheriff. Returning with both, they found George in his bed with blood all over. He had three self-inflicted stab wounds to his chest that was close to his heart and stomach. Mm -hmm. George unsuccessfully attempted suicide. Yeah. They managed to bring him to the nearest hospital where the surgeons stitched him up as best they could. 
probably just rudely done, you know? Probably. You're alive, but it doesn't look pretty. Yeah, for having just tried to commit suicide and getting so scared to die that he wanted help, he was in great spirits, laughing and joking with the doctors and nurses. To me, that sounds like he's insane. Almost, eh? Like, Mm -hmm. I mean, after you kill your whole family, are you really sane? See, oh, that goes into a whole different (laughs) spew for me with uh, insanity charges and not insane charges. I, oh my gosh, like me and you argue about this because if you can go and kill somebody on purpose, you have to be insane. Let alone your whole family. Let alone your whole family. Because a sane person doesn't go out and kill other people. So to me, every person out there is like um, murderers are insane. Should they be treated differently? Hell no. Right. The authorities tried to let his wife Susie know what was going on with her husband, so sent a telegram to Blair, since that's where George said they went to. They were shocked to find out there was no Susie Hassel in Blair. Dun, dun, dun. Where was his wife and children? Ooh. Confused, and now suspicion was arising in the authorities, on December 24th, three weeks after the family disappearance. And the day before Christmas. Right. The police went to George's home, that was now rented out to someone else and started to search the property for the family. Mm-hmm. In the room that he was cleaning up before leaving, they found blood splatter on the floor and walls hiding behind his suitcases. Terrified of what they might have happened to the family, they started to search the property. This brought them to the newly dug ground outside beside the house, the root cellar. The authorities were able to get every able-bodied person from Farwell to help dig. Excavating the area, the authorities were shocked of what they discovered. It would look to be a mass grave where bodies of Susie and their eight children, who were all still in their night clothes, under Susie was a bloodied axe. Susie had her face and skull severely crushed. Alton and Virgil were both shot at close range with a shotgun. Russell had his skull bludgeoned with an axe. All except Alton had at one point been strangled with a stocking as there was still a stocking tied around their necks. George, unfortunately, survived his suicide attempt and was released from the hospital. After being questioned about his family in the root cellar, George confessed to the horrific crimes he did. I did it. I did it, he said. And then asked if he could wait until he had recovered his strength before making a statement. George was held at the Hale County Jail in Plainview, where he was among other prisoners. I would have said, no, you can start, you know, confessing now. Right. Well, you're laughing all joyfully with the nurses and everything after. Yeah. I think you can. You you get it right away. You don't wait. Yeah. Once George recovered his strength, he surprisingly made a full confession. Not only did he give that confession, George had more hidden secrets to give. Remember his wife in what year, California? Yeah, and the three kids. Right. Well, George went on to confess that he murdered his first family a decade earlier in 1917, when they were living in what year, California. His common law wife, Mary Vogel, and her three adoptive children, ages one, five, and eight. I just got to say, like, that's pretty amazing of her to adopt three children back in that time period, and... She was a single mom of these three kids. Like, that's a big endeavor. Was it that he adopted those kids of her kids? Or were those her kids? Those are, no, those were her her adoptive kids. Oh, were they? Yeah. Oh, wow. So during this time, they went under the name Baker. George did not want to give any other details about that annihilation. The Palmer County in Texas did contact the California authorities to look into the deaths at that time. Unfortunately, there was no hit. The police were at a standstill, but that didn't last very long. Since George Hassel had drawn so much attention for having killed not one of his families, but two, Gertrude Hoffman of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, saw this article in the local paper. As soon as she saw his picture, she immediately remembered him from a long time ago. He was the common-law husband of her sister, Mary Vogel. I know, isn't that amazing? I know. That's like... Even back, like, there's no internet or anything like this back then, right? They're just doing it all from papers. You know how, ah, it's just so, like, Mm -hmm. so weird. Last time she saw her sister alive was when she went to visit her family 
on their farm in Whittier, California. Soon after she left, her sister and three children went missing. George only said that the four of them left him and moved to Australia, conveniently far away. Mm-hmm. How are you supposed to look up on that, right? You, well, you can't. No. And it's so weird that people just like up and leave, you know, and they, 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 they take that as truth. I know. This is 1917, and you say that your wife and uh, three kids just went to Australia? It's like, okay. <laughs> okay. Can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah. Gertrude immediately contacted the Texas police, who contacted the Whittier police. Finally, they were able to track down George's work records and spoke to his former employer. He also confirmed that Marie and the three children just disappeared 10 years earlier, but George gave a different story and said they left for San Francisco after the death of her sister and not Australia. Yeah, two different stories. Right. Going to his old neighborhood in Whittier, the authorities spoke to his previous neighbors who still lived there. They said that they had seen George carrying huge trunks and several small bundles out of the house and into the garage. Later, they noticed him taking dirt out of the garage for three days, so he's probably digging. Mm-hmm. On top of that, they could smell smoke on what only could be described as burning rags coming from the kitchen. I'm not sure what it was, that, like burning their clothes or something. Probably, yeah. I'd, I'd probably go with that. Several months later, George brought a woman whom he introduced as his housekeeper, and a child to live with him. George disappeared a short time later, and the woman closed the house up. He returned three months later for a bundle, which the woman had left at a neighbor's house. This was the last time he was seen. I'm not sure what was in that bundle, and uh, I don't think anybody knew because uh, the neighbors didn't look into it either. Okay. With all this information, the authorities went back to George to ask him more questions. George ended up telling more details of what happened in 1917. George said that Marie believed in spiritualism and had visions of treasures buried under the garage floor. In an attempt to find these treasures, George dug up the floor for three days. Finding nothing, he said he got mad and lost his temper with Marie and clubbed her and then strangled her with first with his hands and then with a rope. It's kind of like the M.O. for him, eh? Like he strangles with his hands and finds mm-hmm. something else to use. Yeah. Once she was dead, he went on to the three children and did the same to them. When his family was dead, he brought them all to the hole he dug, looking for the treasure, and buried them all inside of it. The house has since been destroyed, so George drew a map of the property and where to find the bodies. Digging up the spot, the authorities indeed found four people. One adult and three children. All had their skulls crushed and all had rope still around their necks. The boy's skull was found wrapped in heavy cloth. The reality of why he actually killed them was he and his wife were arguing about him joining the army to fight in World War I. Mm-hmm. Because him joining the army would finally fulfill his fantasy about killing people, but she didn't know that he had that fantasy of killing. So he wanted to go to war to kill people, right. but instead he just killed them. Right. Since she didn't want him going to war, they end up fighting. So it wasn't about a buried treasure or anything. It was a, a fight about war. He just wanted to kill. Right. He said the reason behind his confession was so that no other person would get the blame or go to jail for his actions. Oh, yeah. Stand-up uh, guy right oh, there. Oh, yeah. Give him a medal. <laughs> he told the warden, J.S. Spear of the Texas Penitentiary... I'm glad they found the bodies. They know now that it told the truth. I was afraid that when the bodies were found, that somebody else might be accused of the murder. And that would be awful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, do you want a, like a brownie for your actions? A gold star? A gold star, yeah. During the funeral service of the family at Mount Olivet Cemetery, south of Farwell, the district attorney spoke, urging the crowd not to resort to violence. This was a tight-knit community, and Susie was a beloved member. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of anger among the good people of Farwell. While being held waiting for trial, George had to be moved around to different areas and jails under cover of darkness for his own protection. They shouldn't have protected him. Just let them, you know, go at him. Just let God sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> With such a huge trial... Farwell and its sister city, Texaco, became a hustling and bustling area. It was described as a carnival atmosphere. Mm-hmm. 
People were coming to see the man who murdered his family, not once, but twice over. Just imagine, like, all these people coming into this, these small towns and just, you know, this mob mentality, right? Right. So now, on January 26th, 1927, George Hassel's trial began. Though he confessed to killing 13 people, he was surprisingly only addicted for the murder of Alton. Mm-hmm. And I do know of why a lot of people do this in courts is because they try for one murder, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of all the murders. In case something happens, they can try him for the other murders. Oh, that's kind of sneaky. Because double jeopardy, right? If you try for all and he gets off, then you can't try any more of the murders on them. Right. So they usually do one, usually serial killers will do like, like with Robert Picton, right? Willie Picton. They didn't do, I know, but they didn't do all them because they wanted to keep some just in case he got off on some of them, right? That's just an example. I have no no comment on that one because I just, so, uh, that just tears at my heartstrings with that case. I know. But it's, it's a really good example one because you had a friend that wasn't, uh, did, he didn't get tried for it. No, he he wasn't tried for her, although her DNA was in the wood chipper. Yeah, but if something ever happened, then that he could get tried for her yeah. murder, right? So that's yeah. why they do that stuff. Okay, so George said that when he killed his family, there was no thought put into it. He just went on a murderous rage and couldn't stop. So I was trying to get away from first degree murder, it sounds like to me. Yeah. Because uh, you could get a crime of passion, I believe, could get down to like manslaughter. And literally, you could be out in like, what, 20 years with that? Even by killing all these people. That's just sick to me. Yeah. A few news stories of that day stated that Susan Hassel's parents and brothers were in attendance at the trial. In his testimony, he said his initial act was a crime of passion. Which he just said. And that he killed the children to protect himself, which exactly what he's trying to get off. Right. right? George pleaded guilty and even requested the death penalty. So that kind of contradicts that a little bit. Mm. That he wants the death penalty, even though he's not doing first degree murder. Right. Right. So if he just said that he did premeditation, they'd give it the death penalty if he wanted it. Like, oh, you want it? Okay, you're going to fry. Maybe he's an idiot and he didn't realize that. I don't know. Possibly. Jurors were informed that the statement was given voluntarily and the defendant was warned of his constitutional rights. Jurors were told that George Hassel had signed his confession. Now, George was sitting in the courtroom and was about to hear the words describing what he did. Right, they're reading out his confession. Yeah, and the crimes, yeah. Yeah. The jury had sworn to hear all the evidence and return a verdict based on the facts, not emotion. That's hard to keep your emotions out. Yep. I, would, I wouldn't be a, oh, sorry, I wouldn't be a good juror because I'd be like, send him to the gallows, <laughs> chop off his head. Off with his head. <laughs> off with his head. The prosecutor began, gentlemen, I will read it to you. My name is George Jefferson Hassel. I was born at Smithville, Texas, July 26th, 1888, and moved to Oklahoma in 1898. I guess it was. My mother died in 1901. I ran away from home in November of that year. My father died in 1905. I believe it was. But I wouldn't be sure. He was poisoned by my stepmother. That was my first impulse to commit a crime. I went out to the place to kill a whole bunch of them, but I got too much whiskey and didn't use any gun. When questioned about the ball peen hammer beside the bedside, George said, Now, I am honest. I don't know how come the hammer got there. I never put it there. I didn't know it was even in the house. But that was the first thing I seen, was the hammer, a ball peen hammer. They couldn't just give him what he wished, since first they had to decide if he was mentally stable. George was examined by several psychiatric experts. Although they declared him a sociopath, was not enough to qualify him for an insanity defense. So George was officially declared sane. Yay. Two hours later, they had a sentencing ready. Death by electrocution. <laughs> yeah, frying, like we said earlier. <laughs> yep. No, we, we said uh, off with his head. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say fry him. Oh, okay. George's response to his verdict. Thank you, your honor. <laughs> Much obliged. <laughs> That's my southern draw. That's my lodge. I don't have a southern draw. I'm Canadian. <laughs> I think you have to say y'all. Don't they say y'all? I think so. Oh. It would be a year before George would be electrocuted. 
but in, during that time in prison, he was what you would call a model prisoner. He was always cheerful and cracking jokes. He wove doilies as gifts to visitors, fellow inmates, and even the members of the jury who had sent him to death row. Gifts. <laughs> Gifts for his death. Yeah, he's some doilies too. Like he's crocheting like little doilies too, right? <laughs> oh, bring back doilies. No, don't. I, oh my gosh. Doilies are bad. My mom, oh, she love her, but man, she loves her doilies. <laughs> he said his time in prison had been the best time of his life. He was asked why he killed his families, and all he did was point towards his head and said, something was wrong up there. I bet. <laughs> Just over 12 months being held in prison, on February 10th, 1928, 39-year-old George was sent to the electric chair at Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville. He would be the 37th person put to death in the electric chair there. The entire process would only take 20 minutes. He sat there, strapped to the seat, right to the bitter end. George smiled, and he was very calm, waiting for his end of life. His final words were, I'm ready to meet my maker. I think you're going to hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. At 12.29 a.m., George Hassel was given his first shock. The Austin American newspaper reported on the execution. Hassel was in the death chair eight minutes. He was given three shocks. After the first, he was motionless. At the second, he slumped slightly. and the third, no movement of his body was apparent. Dr. E. L. Angler Assistant prison physician pronounced him dead. George was buried at Captain Joe Bird Cemetery, which is at Huntsville Prison. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah, that's a crazy case. If you're looking at what I what else I wrote is like all the victims and yeah. ages and stuff like that. Yep. Cause I'm gonna add that to um our bus broke. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's a crazy case. Like, oh my god, like killing one family is one thing, but killing two of your families? That's like unheard of almost. Killing one, yeah, once is too much as it is. You're like a double family mm -hmm. annihilator. I know. Oh, this is this was a crazy case for me to research. Thank you. Yeah. And also, thank you so much for reading it. Oh, you're welcome. As I'm reading, or as you're reading it, I'm trying not to cough, <laughs> like <laughs> screw up everything, but I, I couldn't do it. I hope I did a little bit of justice. I think I did pretty good I on think it. you did, but thank you so much. No worries. I love this COVID's you. hit us hard. <laughs> it has. It has a lot. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we didn't want to do two weeks without episodes. Like, no. Oh, two weeks. And we had a lot to talk about, too. We had we had a lot going on in our life right now. We Yeah, we do. Patreon, merch. Yeah. We have a lot. But things are growing with us. So, yeah. Things are going really well. Yeah. But, oh, and also your schedule, your work schedule changed. So I'm on lesser hours now for work. So Yay. it's less listening to all the podcasts, but I still get some. Oh, come on. You know you're going to keep <laughs> Yeah, you're addicted. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's probably going to do it for us today. Do you have anything else? Just talk about our um, Facebook. In Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Twitter. We have a lot of followers. Man, like Twitter's going off the hook. Yeah. So thank you for all our followers. And uh, again... Thank you to Patty Kinney. You will get your sticker. She's the last winner. Yeah, we also have a lot of new people listening. So if you're new here, thanks for joining us and giving us a chance. Yeah. And also, too, we've had a couple of reviews on uh, iTunes. And we want to thank you guys for those as well. Those always help us. We appreciate them so mm -hmm. much. It makes us a lot easier to be seen. And yeah. And we just really appreciate it. We appreciate everybody who's listening. Yeah. We feel the love. We do. Like, yeah, it's been really nice. And especially with our week off, we've had a lot of words of encouragement. It's we did lots really of messages nice. and everything. Yeah. And, oh, bless their hearts. My gosh. That was so sweet. Yeah, so many. Was. Yeah, so many messages. So, anyways, I think we're done because I'm, like, <laughs> dying struggling? here. I'm, yeah, the struggle bus? I'm trying not to cough. She's going back to bed. Yeah. Okay, so, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Yes, thank you. So, the world is not always as it seems. No, it's not. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.